In this video, we're going to debunk the five most common myths about barefoot shoes using science. For those who don't know, barefoot shoes have a thin and flexible minimus sole that lack arch support, any significant amount of cushion, and they're also wider in the toe box instead of coming together to a point like most other shoes. With that explanation out the way, let's get started with some myth busting. Myth number one, without cushioned soles to absorb impact forces, my body will be at a higher risk of getting injured when I walk or run. So what does the research say? It it shows that about 75 to 80 percent of runners who wear cushion shoes heel strike. However, barefoot style runners predominantly forefoot strike. This change in running style makes sense because it is much more painful to heel strike without cushioning to absorb the shock. If we then compare a study which measured the impact force curve of shoe runners who heel strike versus barefoot runners who tend to forefoot strike, we see the following. The heel striking shoe runner has a double peak in the impact force graph. The first is from the initial heel strike and the second is when the toes come down and make contact with the ground before push-off. In comparison, the forefoot striking barefoot runner land on their forefoot. The heel then lowers down to the ground before it lifts back up in the toe off, producing a pretty uniform curve. Now the area underneath each curve is the total amount of impact force the body experiences on each of these steps. If we overlay the two curves, we can see the difference in total impact experienced by the body. The shoe runners clearly experience more overall impact forces, mostly due to their first peak, known scientifically as the impact transient. But there is another important issue to consider, that is the rate at which the body experiences force. If we look at the point just after a shoe runner has struck the ground with their heel reaching that impact peak and compare it to the same period in the barefoot runner's running cycle, we see that the barefoot runner experiences lower ground impact forces, three times lower according to the research. You see the big and strong Achilles tendon and calves of the barefoot runner in combination with their flexible foot arch absorbs most of the initial impact. This then gets stored as elastic energy to be released in the next step. On the other hand, the heel striker is dependent on the shoe for all the shock absorbing. And as you can see from the impact graphs, the slab of EVA of shoe foam is no match for our strong living structures in our legs and feet. On top of that, shoes are also unable to store and recoil that energy effectively back into the next step. This should be of no surprise considering that we have been running since the beginning of our existence. With bodily structures that have evolved to adapt to this activity over so many years, can one really believe that the cushion running shoe, which has only been a thing since the 70s, can compete? I think it's safe to say that this myth is busted. Moving on, myth number two. My feet are flat, so I need arch support. Well, there are four layers of muscles in the feet which help keep the foot arches prominent and stable. If these muscles are weak, then while standing and walking, the foot will pronate or collapse inwards into the shape we identify as flat. Now, you may respond by saying, exactly, Chris, my feet are weak. That's why we need arch support to help out. While I think this argument has some merit, it does lack sufficient depth. A more holistic approach seeks to understand the root cause of the problem. For example, a study found that children who wore shoes for more than eight hours a day were more likely to have flat feet when they grew up than children who wore shoes for less hours per day. Another study on 2,300 children showed that flat feet were three times more prevalent than those who predominantly wore shoes compared to those who were predominantly barefoot. And we found a third study which compared the presence of flat feet in 75 members of the native Mexican Tahiramara tribe who predominantly wear barefoot sandals to 75 five urban Americans who predominantly wear conventional footwear. The researchers found that only one out of the 75 or 1.3 percent of the Tahiramara presented with flat feet, while 33 percent of the shoe wearing Americans had flat arches. These three studies suggest that cushion shoes don't solve the problem but may actually be causing it. This is because when shoes do all the supportive work for our feet, they become a crutch. But what happens when we remove the crutch and replace it with thin, flexible and unsupported shoes? A recent study did just that by giving minimalist shoes to one of two groups of people for six months and tested their foot strength before and after the period using a toe flexion test. Compared to the group who made no changes to their footwear, the minimalist group saw a significant improvement in foot strength. The scientists from this paper also found that people who had been wearing barefoot style shoes for two and a half years or more had significantly higher arches than the less experienced barefoot shoe wearers. This is because barefoot shoes are like gym for our feet. Their lack of support and flexibility soles promote more movement at the 33 joints which allows the feet to move freely and be exercised. Over time this additional movement makes the feet stronger and more stable. Okay moving on to the third myth. Barefoot shoes can't fix bunions, it's all genetic. 
So if we look at baby's feet, we can see a true expression of our genetic makeup before it's influenced by lifestyle with their feet fanning out in the front and toes in perfect alignment. Whereas most adults' feet seem to present with a different shape, one that tapers inwards at the toes, there is a clear mismatch here. Well, right in the middle of the two are footwear which we place on our feet all day throughout our lives. It's pretty obvious that our feet change shape over the years to fit the shoes we wear. But barefoot shoes are different. They have toe boxes that fit all our toes comfortably. Research shows that when these wide toe box shoes are worn in combination with silicone toe spaces for 12 months, they can significantly improve great toe misalignment issues such as bunions. I'll link to the silicone toe spaces we use down in the description below. I would actually go as far as to say that the natural shaped toe boxes in barefoot shoes are their most important characteristic because if the toes are in mechanically advantageous position then they can drive the whole foot to stability. So if you take one thing from this video it is this focus on finding shoes which don't squeeze your toes together but allow them to splay apart. Myth 4. I've heard that barefoot shoes are dangerous they cause injuries. Honestly this myth has some truth to it but it's not the full story. When you take someone external support away and only give them a thin piece of rubber and cloth to protect their feet, there is a chance that they won't be able to handle the demands of everyday exercise. It's like taking away crutches from someone and telling them to go full send. Most of the literature which found barefoot style shoes to be dangerous did just that. They stuck minimalist shoes on people without a proper transition or adaptation period. It's no wonder some hurt themselves. I mean, let me ask you a question. If someone came to you and said, hey, I'm not very experienced with weight training, but I want to start lifting. Lifting. Would you then load up a barbell for them and get them to start squatting immediately? No, right? That's illogical. Anyone in their right mind would realize that this puts them at a high risk of injury. This doesn't make weightlifting dangerous though. It just means that one needs to give weights their necessary respect by starting off slowly and then gradually building up from there. Research shows that it takes about six months for your feet to get stronger after you start wearing barefoot shoes. But during this time, you should be careful about how much you do in your shoes. Our barefoot strength Academy, for instance, has a transition plan that tells you how much to do each day in your minimalist shoes for the six month period. We have had over a thousand people follow this plan and have never received a complaint from anyone saying they got hurt during the transition. We have proven with our own data set that with the right transition plan, barefoot shoes are not dangerous. And finally, we have myth five. Barefoot shoes are too expensive. I've been reviewing barefoot shoes for more than four years and I've shown shoes on this channel that range from under $50 to $250. There are now barefoot shoes for any budget and as the demand for barefoot shoes continues to grow and more brands into the market, we will see prices become more competitive. I've actually seen this happening over the past year or two. I just wrote a blog post with a list of all the models we have tested that are under $100 US. The list is surprisingly long. I'll link to it below. With that, we can add a final myth-busting stamp to the list. What other misconceptions have you heard regarding barefoot shoes? Let us know in the comments and perhaps we can discuss them in future videos. But until then, 